Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to Spec Certa Prep's webinar on clean laboratory techniques. My name is Peter Esco, and I will be moderating today. Before we begin, I'd like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Everyone who registered today will be sent a copy of the presentation slides. And the webinar is being re recorded and will, will be posted on our website so that you may watch it at any time you like. The video will be posted sometime next week, and you will receive a follow-up email with a link when it's available. Any questions you may have will be answered at the end of the webinar. Simply type them in the question box as you think of them, and they will be answered during the Q&A session. With that out of the way, let's get on with today's presentation. I would like to introduce Vanija Sivakumar. Vanija received her PhD from the Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. She worked with Weaver Brothers India as a research chemist for nine years before coming to Spexer to Prep 20 years ago as the QA and regulatory manager. She is currently our vice president of manufacturing. Manager, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Peter. Hi, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Accurate and precise measurements in an analytical lab not only depends on the skill of the analyst, but also on the environment and the tools we provide. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the techniques and tools that can be useful in analyzing the concentration of ultra-low level trace elements. Technology in the manufacture of instruments has evolved leaps and bounds in the past few decades. Detection limits have decreased tremendously. Instruments with these new innovative technologies can detect trace impurities in PPB, that is microgram per liter, or PPT, that is nanogram per liter, or even at quadrillion, parts per quadrillion, that is picogram per liter. Such instruments are of no use if we do not identify, minimize, or eliminate totally such impurities. The reason is these impurities can cause interference and produce inaccurate results. For accurate trace metal analysis at these low levels, we must avoid contaminating the reference materials and the reagents we use, samples we analyze, and most of all, minimize the contribution from the environment. Just how much is a part per billion or a trillion? These terms, parts per billion and parts per trillion, are abstract terms. We can understand this better if I express this in real units that are more familiar to us. Take, for instance, unit of time, second. One second in 32 years is one part per billion. One second in 320 centuries it's one part per trillion. Money, which we all love, one cent in ten million dollars is one part per billion. One cent in ten billion dollars is one part per trillion. Volume, one drop of vermouth in 500 barrels of gin is one part per billion. One drop of vermouth in 500,000 barrels of gin is one one part per trillion. Unit of length, inch. One inch in 16,000 miles is one part per billion. One inch in 16 million miles is one part per trillion. In these days, analysis at the low level is not limited by the instrumentation. Limitation comes from interference due to contamination of elements that are of not your interest. What are the sources of contamination? We use reference materials to calibrate our instruments. Starting materials used in the preparation may contain trace impurities. You also use various digestion methods to prepare your samples for analysis. Water, acid, and even laboratory wear can add impurities. Storage containers can leach impurities into solution. Most of all, the laboratory environment is cause for concern. 
the certified reference material, in future, I'll be abbreviating this as CRM, is made from very high pure metals. Where such high pure metals are not available, they are produced from very high pure compounds. In addition to assaying the metal content before its use in CRM, the starting material should be tested for trace impurities. These impurities can cause overlap of spectra, producing inaccurate results. Besides these trace metal impurities, anions like chloride, fluoride, oxalate, and sulfate contaminants have to be identified because the presence of these ions can precipitate elements such as silver, lead, barium, and rare earth elements. The major component of an aqueous standard is water. Water is also used in a large quantity by your lab. The overall quality and accuracy of analysis depends on the quality of water that is used. American Society of Testing Materials, ASTM, specifies four types of water. Type 1 is recommended for trace metal analysis. What are the specifications for type 1? Total dissolved solids should be less than 0.1 milligram per liter for type 1. Specific resistance should be between 15 to 18 mega ohms per centimeter. The pH is not applicable here because ASTM eliminated this from specification for this grade of water does not contain constituents in sufficient quantity to significantly alter the pH. Color retention time for potassium permanganate should be greater than 60 minutes. Soluble silica should not be detected. Bacterial count should be zero colonies per mil. This shows the state of the art ASTM type 1 water system used by Spec 30 Prep. City water is pumped through a 10 micron filter and water softener tanks. Sodium is exchanged for hardness imparting calcium and magnesium. It then passes through a 5 micron filter and a UV disinfection process. Water from here is taken to reverse osmosis column where salt content is reduced and to then two tanks of mixed bed resins to remove all cations and anions leaving behind hydrogen ion and hydroxide molecules. Before the point of use, water gets polished by two virgin tanks, disinfected, filtered once again by a 0.2 micron filter. After all this process, water shows a resistance of 15 to 18 mega ohms per centimeter, disinfected, filtered, and is ready to use in the lab. Water does produce exceed the expectation of ASTM type 1 water and is fit for use in trace metal analysis. Acid plays a major role in sample analysis. You use it for dissolution of materials or samples, for digestions and dilutions. Contaminants present in acids can contribute to erroneous results. Any part of the analytical process must use high purity acid. For example, if you use 5 ml of an acid with 100 ppb nickel diluted to 100 ml volume can introduce 5 ppb of nickel in the sample. Hence, you need a very high pure acid. But very high pure acids are 10 times more expensive than technical grade acids. An economic and effective way to produce ultra-high pure acid is to use a PDFA acid still. This employs a distillation method of surface evaporation without boiling through the use of infrared heaters. The created acid vapor is condensed and collected in a PFA or a Teflon bottle. This process avoids transport of particulate aerosol with the distillate. PDFA still can handle all common acids except sulfuric acid. 
With this process, majority of the metals can be reduced below microgram per liter in a single distillation. So far, we examined contaminants that could come from water and acids that the labs generally use. The other major source of contamination in a lab are the pipettes and the general labware. As a good laboratory practice, pipettes have to be calibrated as well as thoroughly cleaned. Cleaning procedures should ensure that the pipettes are free of contaminants even at PPT levels. Usually, pipettes have memory effect. Remnants of what you pipetted before would show up in later use even after thorough cleaning. Hence, the process of cleaning is very critical. In order to demonstrate the effect of manual cleaning, we scanned a 2% high pure nitric acid for impurities after delivering it through a thoroughly but manually cleaned pipettes. The ICPMS results in microgram per liter are shown in this table. As you can see, silver, aluminum, calcium, iron, sodium, and lead are very high. Very frustrated by the remnant contamination in pipettes, even after a thorough cleaning, our chemist designed a unique pipette washer. Here, rows of conical shaped plastic pipette holders are connected to a water line. Water fills each pipette, shoots out of the pipette tip, and rains a shower of water over the outside of the pipette. Because water gushes out in force, it washes away all the impurities sticking to the walls of the pipette. Pipette, water has, piper, pipette washer has unique features. It, has 20, it can hold 23 pipettes, can accommodate 0.5 ml to 200 ml pipettes, it's a very small footprint to fit most spaces. It can also be used to dry pipettes after washing it by connecting it to a vacuum line. You can also enhance your washing by adding wash solutions or surfactants. So, once again, we analyzed 2% high pure nitric acid solution delivered through pipettes that are washed in pipette washer. Most of the impurities were less than 0.01 ppb concentration, except for iron and calcium, which were at 0.2 ppb. This slide shows the comparison of impurities from the two process, manual cleaning versus pipette washer. As you can see, calcium is about 18.8 .8 in manually cleaned pipette, whereas from the pipette washer, it had only 0 0.20 ppb. Sodium was 19.1 in manually cleaned pipette, whereas in pipette washer, it was less than 0 0.01. In general, the manually washed pipettes contain high pure impurities. This could be due to a number of reasons. When manually washing, you may tell your technicians to wash according to your lab protocol, but repetitive washing is prone to errors and also missteps. Pipette washer washes more effectively, thus cleaning the pipettes inside and outside. So far, we have reviewed few things that are commonly used in a lab. Next to be considered are bottles. Calibration standards are shipped to you in bottles. You store diluted solutions in bottles. Bottles are of various types. Trace impurities from the walls of the bottles can leach into the solution and increase contaminants. The quantity depends on the type of material used for making the bottles. The ideal storage containers would be fluoropolymers, which is a Teflon, and synthetic quartz, polyethylene, and natural quartz. Borosilicate glass leaches out boron and silicon and is not suitable for trace metal analysis. This 
chart gives you an idea of contribution of trace impurities from different containers. Polystyrene, which gives you the major impurities like sodium, titanium, and aluminum, total number of elements that were imported were eight to a total concentration of four ppb. But polystyrene tends to become brittle in the presence of acids over a period of time. Teflon is Teflon gives you about 19 total parts per billion in concentration of the major impurities, calcium, lead, iron, and copper. Total number of elements may be 24, but it's expensive and not cost effective. Hence, the ideal storage container in this situation is LDPE, low density polyethylene. This gives about 23 total concentration of the ions and the number of elements being 18, the major impurities are calcium, titanium, and zinc. But due to low cost, relatively low level of impurities, and is also more tolerant to acid, LDPE becomes the ideal storage container of choice. Tubing is perhaps not something you use often in your laboratory. But as a CR manufacturer, we exercise a lot of care in the selection of tubing for packaging solutions. Sometimes we resort to manual filling to avoid contamination, even if it is labor intensive. If we had to choose a tubing, among silicon, neoprene, and form ed, we use the form ed tubing because that is the least Import, import, that imports least contamination in 5% nitric acid solution. Next to be considered is a sample preparation method. This is one of the most crucial steps. Samples can be digested in traditional open vessel or microwave oven. We must avoid at any cost sample to sample cross contamination and be scrupulously clean with regard to anything that comes into contact with the sample. This brings us to the environment in which a sample is prepared and analyzed. So the first question you might ask, is my laboratory clean? To demonstrate, we concentrated redistilled nitric acid in regular and clean labs and then we analyzed it. I want to explain what I mean by regular lab or a clean lab. Regular lab is what you encounter every day. It follows GLP protocols, maintains good housekeeping, and is kept spotless. Regular lab is a clean lab in, in an ordinary sense of the word. However, in this context, clean lab is one that is constructed with high quality special materials has special air handling systems. I'll be explaining about this in a bit. But as you can see, the contamination from aluminum, calcium, iron, sodium, and zinc from regular lab are much higher than from clean lab. So in the previous slide, I mentioned about clean lab. What is a clean room or a clean lab? A room which has a gentle shower of highly filtered air for the purpose of transporting airborne particulate contaminants away from the sensitive samples and maintain a clean environment with low particle concentrations. Environment pollutants that are to be considered are dust, airborne microbes, aerosol particles, and chemical vapors. Applicable standards for this are ISO 14644 and the U.S. Federal Standard 209E. The U.S. Department of Commerce has discontinued the FS 209E. However, it is still widely used by the industries. As per my definition earlier, a typical cleaned room will have a controlled level of contamination that is specified by number of particles per cubic feet or cubic meter for a specified particle size. 
There are various classifications of plain room, class 100, class 1000, etc. To give you an idea, ambient air outside in a typical urban environment will contain about 35 million particles per cubic meter, the particle size being 0.5 microns and higher. But environment class of 100 should not contain more than 100 particles, and the particle diameter being 0.5 microns per cubic foot. In a typical clean room, air entering outside filtered to exclude dust. Air inside is constantly recirculated through HEPA filters, high-efficiency particulate air filter, or through ALPA filters, which is ultra-low penetration air filters, to remove internally generated contaminants. Walls, ceilings, and floors should also be sealed and dust-free. There are various other controls besides engineering control, such as clothing of personnel, special clean room furniture, specialized mops and buckets for cleaning. In addition to particulate control, the clean room is temperature and humidity controlled. The temperature should be maintained around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and the humidity should, relative humidity is about 45 percent. Also, electrostatic charge should be minimized by keeping the lab humidity around 45 percent. If a full-blown clean room is expensive for you, you can use a clean hood to prepare your samples using the following criteria. Common contaminating sources in a regular lab are ceiling tiles, paints, cements, and dry walls. Dry walls can give high calcium and lead contamination. Rust on shelves, equipment, and furniture can give you iron contamination. Carbon, iron, silica can come from your temperature control systems. This is a prep lab we use for preparing samples for ultra-low level ICPMS analysis. It's not only essential to produce a quality sample using high pure materials, well cleaned labish, select proper storage containers. It's essential to package and store low level standards in a clean room as well. We manufactured a solution in clean room and packaged them in two different sets of condition, one in regular lab, another in clean lab. This chart shows a comparison of the solution packaged that way. You can see here iron, sodium, and zinc impurities are at higher level that's, that is kept or stored in a regular lab versus that's packaged and stored in a clean lab. Impurities also can increase with time. We found a considerable increase in concentration of impurity of elements such as aluminum, calcium, iron, magnesium, sodium, and silica, and zinc. There are several probable reasons for this. Dust from the lab environment can contribute calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and silica. Titanium and zinc can come from LDPE bottles. Aluminum and iron from materials of various fixtures used in the laboratory. So how do we control contamination? We must minimize exposure. The apparatus that will contact samples, blanks, or standards should be opened in clean room, clean bench, or glove box. When not in use, it should be kept covered well in a plastic bag or a box. We must clean our work surfaces more frequently. Before processing samples, all work surfaces in the hood, clean bench, and glove box should be cleaned with a wipe, lint-free wipe, soaked with reagent water.
We must select powder-free gloves and use clean gloves when handling equipment, samples, blanks and standards. Because sweat contains potassium, lead, calcium, magnesium, as well as sulfate, phosphate and ammonium ions in addition to sodium and chloride. Use metal-free containers. Volumetric flasks, beakers made out of Teflon, polycarbonate and polypropylene should be used. If clean room is not available, all sample preparation should be performed in a class 100 clean bench or a glove box with flow of air, preferably nitrogen. Use adhesive mats at entry points to control dust and dirt from shoes. Change shoes and or wear shoe coverings to reduce or from bringing dust from outside. Keep lab humidity around 45% to minimize electrostatic charge. Surface charge can be eliminated by use of commercial static eliminators or by wetting your lint-free cloth with high purity ethanol or high purity water and letting it to evaporate in the lab. Lab should be cleaned as soon as it is used. Common dishwash detergents cannot be used. Use that are specially designed for lab glassware. Separate labware into low level and high level. Low level labware is used only for solutions that have metals at below 1 ppm concentration. Same way, high level labware for solutions with above 1 ppm concentrations of metals. Reason? Labware tends to exhibit memory effects from previous solutions. Segregate labware for specific metals. Metals such as lead and chromium are highly absorbed by glass, but not by plastics. For boron and silicon analysis, avoid borosilicate glass. Use plastic te Teflon or quartz labware. Samples containing low levels of mercury, especially in parts per billion levels, have to be stored in glass, polypropylene, or fluoropolymer because mercury vapors diffuse through polyethylene bottles. Avoid lint-producing paper products. Use membrane filters instead of ashless filter paper. Ashless filter paper contains 20 trace elements greater than 1 ppm level. Use no chrome mix instead of chromic acid to clean lab wet. You should not use jewelry, cosmetics, or lotions. Cosmetics and lotions can introduce contaminants like aluminum, calcium, copper, chromium, potassium, etc. into the samples. Some hair dyes contain lead acetate. Calamine lotion used for skin irritation also contains zinc oxide. Selenium is an active ingredient in some anti-dandruff shampoos. Wash lab coats regularly. If you come to the lab straight after your morning swim, you may increase copper contamination in your samples you're working with. As you said, used in swimming pool contain copper. Select gloves that have no powder. Powder in the gloves contains high concentration of zinc. Use ultra clean sample introduction system. How do you determine if you have a clean lab? By running blanks. Think blank. Blanks have to be cleaned to avoid false positive or false negative results. Anything that touches the sample must be absolutely clean. Besides controlling contamination, there are various other things you can use to do a successful analysis in your lab. Test personnel, equipment, and methods with QC samples. Observe clean lab procedures and techniques. Use reference materials that have not expired. Make up and use only freshly prepared calibration standards. Rerun samples using a different dilution factor to check your original analysis. 
Spike appropriate QC samples with expected levels of analytes or use standard additions. Carry blanks through all steps of an analytical procedure. Prepare the dilution in plastic or Teflon as much as possible. Rinse volumetric flask with 1% nitric acid and keep in nitric acid until used. Protocol in this varies from lab to lab. It depends on regulatory specifications as well. You should follow your lab protocol. In the absence of one, you can follow what I described just now. Do the solutions in metal-free clean hood. Use high pure reagents and acids. Ammonium hydroxide and nitric acid are relatively clean. Hydrochloric acid contains high impurities. Rinse pump tubing, if you use pump tubing, with high pure acid, about 2%, used in the matrix. In a typical organic chemistry lab, you would be handling chemicals that may emit irritating vapors. This could cause sneezing or coughing, affecting the general cleanliness in your laboratory. One of our products, Odor Eroder, effectively neutralizes offensive odors and fumes in the lab. It absorbs and chemically transforms chemical odors into harmless compounds that remain trapped within the product. It is highly effective at neutralizing volatile compounds. It is non-toxic and non-contaminating as well as environmentally safe. When this product becomes spent, it changes its color and you could easily know that it is time for replacement. I'm sure most of you would be following some of the ideas presented here. I'm hopeful you have learned few more new ideas and techniques to decrease contamination in your analytical lab. All results are based on random sampling of materials. Supporting data is derived from these references as well as our own research. Thank you for attending this presentation. Any questions? We use Teflon bottles for storing our prepared standards. What is the maximum time can you use these bottles? Once again, it depends on the concentration. Teflon bottles, in, as such, you can use for six months. But if you have a solution that contains low level, like 1 ppb, it's better to use it within that six months. The reason is when you open it, it could uh, absorb contamination from the environment. Also, when you pour a solution from a Teflon bottle, it produces uh, electro electronegative charge around the neck. So before you open the bottle, wipe it with a lint-free cloth with a reagent-grade water, and then pour it into whatever you have to use it on. Why is there cadmium in plastics? The plastic uh, manufacturers use something called plasticizers. They have cadmium, antimony, and zinc, mostly. These are used in plastics. And that is the reason sometimes cadmium leaches out into the solution. There is another question here. Water eroded. Do you add it to the target, or is it like an air freshener? Um, the question was? The order eroded, do you add it to the target or you use it as an air freshener? No, it, you cannot add it to the target. You have to keep it open in a laboratory and perhaps it acts like an air freshener. It absorbs the water from the lab. Any suggestions on the use and cleanliness of disposable micropipette tests? The question was, any suggestions? on the use and cleanliness of disposable plastic micropipette tips. This again follows the laboratory uh, practice, good laboratory practice. All these tips cannot be kept on a surface which is contaminated already by some chemicals or other. You have to hold the pipette in such a way that you pick up the plastic tip without 
touching the tip of the plastic and as soon as you use it, you just dispose it off straight into whichever container you would like to dispose it. What is the main reason for the degradation of inorganic standard? Uh, this is a very big question, it's a general question. Um, the inorganic standard, depending on what element or analyte it contains, sometimes the multi-component in a mix may not be very compatible for a long time. Over a period of time, one or two elements may interact chemically and that you would see a degradation. And if the concentration is much lower in a PPB level or that also can pick up, can lose or pick up contaminants from the environment. Say you have a standard iron with one PPB. Because the environment contains one PP, the lots of iron, your standard after a period of time may not read one PPB. It could be 20 PPB. So this is the reason your manufacturer puts your expiration date because in a lab you cannot expect it to be stored as carefully as we do in our manufacturing areas. Water, water eroder able to remove the minor acid fume. We have tested it in our um, inorganic lab um, when we were studying if it was contaminating or giving a cross contamination. Uh, we found it is more effective in organic lab and minor, because we used a hood which was removing the acid fumes, we couldn't really know whether um, the acid fumes were neutralized by this odor eroder or not. The use of bottle top dispensers add contamination. Um, not really. See, when you close your bottle, initially you close uh, with a gloved hand and thoroughly tighten it. Then the final, uh, the last stage, you either close it or open it with that. I don't think it could impart um, contamination. What kind of detergents must be used with the pipette washer for best results? The type of um, detergent that could be used is, um, uh, you know, non-ionic mix like um, Alkanox. That's, that's what I remember. There are some available uh, in the catalog, Fisher catalog or VW or catalog, if you see, they would specify this. It, what we use is Alkanox. Do you know of any specific problems associated with using organic solvents in making standards or as your dilutant for your samples? Uh, I'm not sure you are talking about purely a organic uh, mix or you are talking about a combination of organic as well as aqueous mix. I'm not sure on that. If you could a little bit explain that, I would be able to see if I can answer that question. There is another question from a customer here. Uh, I would like to know about what the maximum lifetime for mercury about 100 ppb. Mercury as such um, is not only a storage problem, sometimes it has analytical problem too. 100 ppb, about 0.1 ppm, it's, um, we have tested it and in a proper selection of matrix, we were able to preserve it for six months. But beyond that, it's very hard. And I, as I have said, the selection of matrix is very important for mercury standards. What is the, the question here is, what is the reason for the great difference between cleaning by machine or manual? As I said, manual pipe cleaning is prone to, uh, you know, I, the word I can think of right now is boredom. Uh, you, you may say to your technician, rinse six times, but do you know really if the technician did it six times? Whereas in a um, pipette washer, the way it, unfortunately I don't have a video, you can log on to our um, website and you would see a demonstration of that pipette washer. The way the water comes into the pipette through the tips, is it gushes out. 
when it gushes out like that for 15 minutes, all the impurities from inside as outside get washed away. What is the best way to clean plastic ware in order to remove possible contaminants? To clean plastic ware to remove possible contaminants. So in our lab, before um, when we do digest certain samples in Teflon, before we use that, we boil some nitric acid. Under, of course, under the hood, taking all the proper precautions, we fume nitric acid a couple of times. And then sometimes if the sample that is to be used can tolerate hydrochloric acid, we do aqua regia as well. And then we rinse it thoroughly with double DI water before introducing our sample. How The question here is, how do you determine, set, as a manufacturer, expiration date of an inorganic, say, 100 ppm lead standard? We all know the chemistry behind each of the elements that we make. That's one of, the, uh, one of the reasons. The second way we do is we have data over a period of time. We were making these standards for the past uh, 45 years plus. So we have collected data over a period of time, and this data will be reviewed. And based on that, we set the expiration date and time. Do the stocking temperature affect the stability of the standards? And the question is, stocking temperature, can it affect the stability of standards? See, as long as you store your solution in ambient conditions, it's okay, not a problem. Uh, during the, you know, the millennium change 2000, okay, we did uh, study storing the solutions at four degrees and below because we were worried whether there will be a power interruption for um, quite a number of days. We found after analysis of those solutions, we found that absolutely nothing happened. As long as we tied it back to the room temperature and we analyzed it, we were okay. It was no problem at all. So storing at a low temperature is not a problem. But if you increase the temperature to greater than 30 degrees, 35 degrees Celsius, what happens is there could be transpiration loss which could be enhanced because of the higher temperature, then the solution may not be um, giving you the correct reading. What can beryllium contamination come from? Yes, this is a good question. So when I was preparing the slide, I did see a beryllium contamination in one of the plastic bottles. We were wondering whether it was coming from any of the plasticizers they use. Though a plastic manufacturer does not put beryllium as such, they use cadmium, antimony, um, and lead. Um, they, they do not use beryllium, but it could have been a contaminant in one of them. Perhaps because of that, we did see some beryllium in that. OK, that seems to be all the questions that we have. Uh, there are a couple asking about odor eroders, the part numbers. Um, actually, I was going to let everybody know that you will, everybody who attended today will be receiving a complimentary sample of odor rotors. So we'll send it to you along with, with, uh, with some more information. But uh, if there's any other questions, then uh, feel free to type them in the chat box right now. Doesn't look like we have any. <laughs> You're welcome, John. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, looks like there's no more no more questions. So I'd like to thank Vanija once again for giving a very informative presentation. As a reminder, we will be sending everybody a copy of the presentation slides and a recording of the webinar will be posted on our website next week. We'll let everybody know uh, when that's posted so you can go ahead and view it. And again, everybody who registered today will also be receiving a free sample of odor rotors. And you will also receive an email invitation to participate in a short survey so we can get your feedback on today's webinar. Uh, everybody who completes the survey will receive a 10% discount off any order of $100 or more. Any, anyone interested in any of our previous webinars, the BPA and phthalates in water or the chemical gourmet can see on-demand versions of them right now on our website at specscsp.com.
And uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending today, and we hope that you walked away with some useful tips and information on minimizing contamination in your lab. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you again in a future webinar. Thank you.